Thomas Edward Blake Jr. was born at the beginning of the 20th century in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was the first and only child of Thomas Blake and Blanche Wolliver. Tragedy struck early in Tom's life. When he was only 11 months old, Blanche died of tuberculosis. Devastated, Tom's father sent him north to live with his Aunt Sarah on the shores of Lake Superior in Washburn, Wisconsin. Tom lived with Sarah until the ravages of the Spanish flu epidemic closed the Washburn schools. 16-year-old Blake felt his future lay elsewhere, so began his lifelong quest. Tom rode the rails cross-country trying different jobs. Nothing seemed a good fit for this restless soul. A 1920 visit to his Aunt Sarah, now living in Detroit, proved a turning point for the young Blake. Recall Tom, I first met Duke Kahanamoko in Detroit. He and his fellow Hawaiian Olympic team members were on their way home from the 1920 Olympics in Antwerp. Duke had just won the gold in the 100 meter freestyle swimming event, just as he had in the 1912 Stockholm Games. A newsreel showing their performances was running at a local theater, and they had gone to see themselves in action. I was lucky enough to have found myself at the same showing, sitting near the champion. I intercepted him in the lobby and asked to shake his hand. Sure, he replied, holding out his big paw. His firm, hearty handshake had somehow made me feel that it included an open invitation to visit him in his Hawaiian island home. The following year, ever on the move, Tom made his way out to California, settling in Los Angeles. He stated, I had to find a way of making a living. I thought myself a pretty good swimmer, though I had no formal training, and decided to try out for a club team. I went up to the Los Angeles Athletic Club and persuaded the night watchman to let me practice after hours. One day I approached Fred Cady, the dive and swim coach there, and asked if I might try out for their swim team. Uninterested, he turned me down. I continued practicing nights and later asked him for another tryout. The club's national champion, Walter Spence, was there and told Katie, give the kid a chance. I swam a few laps against Spence and cleaned up on him. Having proven himself, Tom immediately began going to all the meets. He was the best in all of the events, including distance, until Walter O'Connor and Johnny Weissmuller came along. Tom said, I sacrificed all I had just to swim. Contrary to what I first believed, there was little financial support from the clubs, even though swimming was considered an exceptional skill, respected by all sports fans. I lived a life of forced austerity with very little to eat. Even in this weakened state, Tom competed and won his first gold medals at the Far Western American Athletic Union Championships. Throughout his life, those two wins continued to mean the most to him. In July of 1922, Tom was sent to represent the club at the Amateur Athletic Union's Open National Distance Swimming Championship in Philadelphia. Blake covered the 10 miles of the race against a stiff head win in 2 hours 24 minutes to win, becoming America's distance swimming champion. The win launched an outstanding swimming career. Unfortunately, a total record of his wins has never been chronicled. Tom reached the end of his competitive swimming career around the time of the 1929 stock market crash. It was during the Depression that he was forced to sell many of his medals and trophies in order to eat. Throughout the 1920s, Tom kept the wolf from his door by lifeguarding and when it fit into his schedule as a stuntman and actor in the budding movie industry. His first role was in the 1922 silent film, Where the Pavement Ends. It was here that he said they had him wrestling a dead shark. In 1927, during the filming of Trail of 98, his lifelong passion for water safety and the development of rescue equipment was ignited. Tom would later recall, I remember it as the Copper River tragedy. I was working under contract to MGM and I and eight other guys were sent to Alaska. We were supposed to do a stunt which included taking boats down a raging river. The setup wasn't safe and four men drowned. Although the Copper River tragedy was a sobering event, 
It was actually the apparent shallowness of the Hollywood community and the tight scheduling demands which led to Tom's decision to leave the movie business. Though he may have done well considering his good looks and athletic physique, it was just another job that wasn't a good fit. His last contributions to the movie industry would be the Pacific film Devil's Island, where he doubled for Clark Gable, and the 1942 film Wake Island. Tom had gotten his first and unsuccessful ride on a surfboard while lifeguarding in California in 1921. It would be three years before he would try it again. Wanting to learn more about surfing, he went to the source, setting out for the Hawaiian Islands in 1924. This trip began his long love affair with Hawaii, its people, their culture, and history. Stated Tom, I could live simply there, quietly, without the social life. I could dress as I pleased, sleep in the sunshine, and eat fruit from the trees in my own yard. Tom's unheard of self-created lifestyle, which included a vegetarian diet, became a prototype for the beach culture, which was to come and is still prevalent today. In Honolulu, Tom sought out the historic surfboards displayed at the Bishop Museum. Studying them, he was drawn to their possible uses in water rescue. Naturally, the rest of his time was spent on the beach at Waikiki. There, he introduced himself to the members of the Outrigger Canoe Club. This group, traditionally unwelcoming to outsiders, accepted him on the strength of his past records as a swimmer. Tom recalled, These guys at Waikiki loved surfing so much that they'd made a career of it. Taking a 9-to-5 job was out of the question. Making a few dollars teaching the tourists to surf enabled them to live their chosen lifestyle, and I got into the same routine. Returning to the U.S. mainland and lifeguarding at Santa Monica, Tom found himself working side by side with Duke. They saw each other every day and became constant swimming and surfing companions, solidifying what became a lifelong friendship. It was during this time that Tom met and married 18-year-old Frances Cunningham. They honeymooned in Hawaii, but separated soon after, divorcing within the year. Fellow lifeguard and surfer Wally Burton would later recall, Tom worshipped the ocean. It, along with surfing, meant more to him than anything or anyone. In 1924, Tom had appealed to be allowed to restore the surfboards of the Bishop Museum. Refused, and not it being in his nature to be denied, Tom approached them on this return the following year. Permission was granted, and in the process of shaping a longboard for himself, Tom stumbled upon the idea for a hollowboard design. It began by drilling out hundreds of holes in a solid redwood board and then covering them with a thin veneer of wood. In 1928, armed with his continually evolving design, Tom won the first Pacific Coast Surf Riding Championship in California. He went on to set world speed paddling records in Honolulu in 1929 and 1930. However, what should have been a time of celebration was soured by the bitterness felt by the locals. It was not one of their own who had won, nor had he won using a traditional board. Although Tom was an extremely competitive person, he was also sensitive in ways that made him back off from future races in the islands. He felt that he had damaged his relationships with his Hawaiian friends and had brought about the end of the really good day. Tom's hollow board water sled was patented in 1932. The same year, he joined three fellow paddle boarders in making the 29-mile crossing from Santa Monica to Catalina Island. Though publicized as a race, Tom thought of it as an opportunity to showcase the use of his paddleboard design as an open ocean rescue device. Ever the competitor, Tom practiced three hours a day, making the crossing in five hours, 23 minutes. His friends finished about an hour later. Tom competed in many paddleboard races, but this remained the most memorable. 
The trophy was a blue urn, which he designated as the container for his ashes when he died. Tom would recall that after all the hoopla was over, exhausted and hungry, he was left without a ride home, and he had to walk. Always longing to get back to the beach, Tom put the marketing of his boards into the hands of professionals. His hollow surfboards and paddle boards were soon to be found worldwide. During the latter part of the 1930s, the Hollow Board Rescue Board was adopted by the Pacific Coast Life Saving Corporation and the American Red Cross National Aquatic Schools. Though arguably his greatest innovation, there were many more to follow. In 1929, he introduced a waterproof housing for cameras. It was with photographs taken with this camera that he made a submission to the National Geographic Society magazine. Although they chose not to use his accompanying article, the photos were published in 1935. In 1931, he began working on the prototype of what was to become the first windsurfer. It was put into production in 1940. In 1932, Tom introduced the collapsible surfboard. He and Johnny Weissmuller had been photographed with Johnny holding one, though Tom said he had never seen Weissmuller on a board. Said a reporter in Santa Monica, All a fellow has to do to get this ingenious and very seaworthy collapsible paddleboard to the beach is to fold it up and put it in the rumble seat of his car. At the beach it is filled with air and away go the surfboard riders for a dash on the crest of a comber. Tom was also the first person to use a leash. He attached a line to both himself and the surfboard which kept the board from getting away from him. For big surf, he applied a metal handle to hold on to when swimming into a wave. Tom also developed the idea of surfing contests staged for exhibits of distance and skill. These continue to be the type of competition most surfers prefer. All of Tom's accomplishments were soon overshadowed by one of his most enduring, the application of a fin to the surfboard, which provided better control. Although the fin, or skeg, eventually caused a quantum shift in surfboard riding and its development, it was not until after World War II that it became readily adopted. Now a highly prized collectible, the 1935 publication of his book, Hawaiian Surf Riders was the history of the Hawaiian people, their customs, and the role of the surfboard in their society. The sport, which had all but disappeared in the previous century, had made its comeback, in large part due to the surfing exhibitions held by the Kahanamoku brothers. An accomplishment worthy of bragging rights, the length of a wave ride remains a big part of surfing. Tom remembered two of his in particular, with his personal best having been documented in the Guinness Book of World Records, June 1, 1936, north and east of Waikiki, an estimated distance of 4,500 feet. Tom spent the years preceding World War II driving around the country, promoting the merits of his hollowboard paddleboard as a life-saving device to every summer camp and resort he could find. He developed the spun aluminum torpedo buoy in 1937, and in 1940, the less successful spun aluminum rescue ring. He pitched the development of motorized surfboards to the Bendex Corporation of New York, envisioning a future radio-controlled model. But the commercial development of this design was not to be. His plans and instructions for building a Blake hollow board were published in a 1939 issue of Popular Science magazine, thus making it available to every high school shop class and shaper worldwide. In July of 1941, just months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Tom sailed from Honolulu back to California. Now 40 years old, he enlisted in the Coast Guard and was assigned coastal watch duty. Toward the end of the war, he worked in the deactivation of Japanese ordnance. After his discharge, it was back to the vagabond life of guarding beaches and teaching kids to swim. From Florida to New York, California to Honolulu, Tom seemed to keep the surfing lifestyle going. 
In 1952, while riding the big surf at Makaha, Tom met with another life-altering event. For the first time in his life, he needed to ask for help in the water. Tom felt he was getting old. He believed there was a physical failure of his heart. Combined perhaps with too much sun, the results of a life of insufficient nutrition, and the post-war growth of Honolulu, Tom chose to leave the islands and surfing for good. Moving back to the mainland in 1955, he traveled between Malibu, Boca Raton, the California desert, and finally home to Washburn, the little town on the big lake that he loved so well. People who were then in their teens remembered Tom camping near the water's edge in either an outfitted station wagon or a van, sharing his philosophies with anyone willing to listen. He had entered into a phase of his life putting himself into his writings, often tying them together with surfing. The foundation of my philosophy, stated Tom, is that nature equals God. One might rightly say surf riding is prayer of a high order, that the sea is a beautiful church and the wave a silent sermon. Tom's final treatise, Voice of the Atom, was finished in 1988. In these later years, Blake was accorded many awards, citations, and accolades for his lifetime of achievements. He and his dear friend, Duke Kahanamoko, having been the only persons inducted into both the International Swimming Hall of Fame and the Surfing Hall of Fame. True to his nature, all of this hoopla meant little to him. That all happened a long time ago, in another lifetime, he'd say, while turning down invitations to appear at events held in his honor. Tom truly treasured, however, the 1974 honor bestowed upon him by the National Surf Life Saving Association of America, in which was proclaimed their gratitude for the thousands of lives saved because of his inventive contributions in the interest of his fellow human beings. Tom Blake died in May of 1994, a full 42 years after proclaiming failing health. In line with his philosophies, he must have felt it a mere metamorphosis from the form human being into some other unknown combination of atoms. Tom's protege, Tommy Zahn, had this to say about him. It is true Blake is a most intriguing figure, a man of heroic dimension. Tom has seen it all, so many accomplishments, as well as being a sterling example and gentleman. Tom has never wavered from his essential values. He was a lifetime innovator, tragic in a way that he never cashed in on it, but then that wasn't his way. One key aspect of his lifestyle was to lower your overhead, thereby giving yourself more time and more freedom. I've always envied him this, living simply and uncluttered. It's not easy. I have so many mingled feelings about Tom he is certainly the strongest man I know in every sense. He has inspired generations of watermen.